Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read the first six verses of Ephesians chapter 4 this morning as we continue our series on the one another's. Passages in the New Testament where we're instructed to do something for one another as Christians in the body of Christ. And so I'm going to read those uh, verses in a moment, but I just wanted to say if you're a young adult, uh, we're going to call that uh, high school graduate to 30 uh, tonight. We are hosting a young adult cookout at the Garmin House. Um, if, we'd love for you to join us. We're going to have a cookout and some great discussion. And so uh, if you want to know more about that, connect with me after the service. I'll make sure you get the um, address for that. But we'd love to have you uh, as we cook out and hang out and have a good time. Uh, that's going on this evening. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we ask that as we bring our hearts before it, that you would instruct us, that your spirit would give us insight into our own lives and how we can put Christ on display together in a local church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there, there is this uh, popular marriage diagram that I think probably uh, most of you have seen. It looks a, a little bit like this that helps people wrap their heads around how to cultivate closeness in our relationships with one another. And, and it essentially, it helps us to see how taking the focus off of just growing closer together and helping each person uh, instead individually grow toward godliness. It's kind of a simple idea. You know, if we grow towards God and not just focus on growing towards one another, inevitably as we mature towards God and imitation of His life and character, it's going to draw us together in ways that are substantive and important. And so uh, I think it's a helpful diagram. If you've never thought of your marriage that way, I would encourage you to think of it that way and think about ways that you can help individually cultivate your life toward God together. And as I was thinking about, though, the passage that we read today, I was thinking about this same idea in the fact that it's not just a good idea for marriage, but it captures what Paul calls here in this passage our holy calling together. He sees us as a people who are called to walk towards God, to walk towards a maturity that is worthy of the good news of Jesus that we have received, the faith that we have in Him. And so, really, the calling of Christians is for us to recognize that we share a connection to God and we share an objective future promise and reality that ties us together and will draw us on toward a greater sense of connection as we mature. That means if you are a part of a Christian body, a local church, and you grow in maturity, one of the things that will inevitably happen if your maturity is genuine, you will begin to draw closer to other Christians who are walking towards God. You will see that spring forth. You will exhibit a certain type of qualities. The, this idea is at the heart of Paul's motivation then for us to bear with one another in love in this passage because if you are walking towards God, you may be of one level of maturity now, but in time, if you're both together in Christ walking towards God before long, you're going to find yourself closer together. <laughs> You're going to have to learn to relate to one another in maturity. 
And, and so here's kind of the main idea of this passage that I want to make sure that we don't miss today. Uh, I like to put the bottom line up front. And in this passage, this is what we understand. Christians have a future-oriented calling that is best fulfilled by bearing with one another in love. Christians have a future-oriented calling. We're going somewhere. We're walking in a particular direction. And that calling is best fulfilled in the present by bearing with one another in love. That's how we exercise this calling. Now I want to show you that main idea before we look at some of the ways that this passage helps us embrace that. And so let me show you the importance of this main idea by helping you understand what has led the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter to a group of Christians in the city of Ephesus, made up of both Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, a, a, whole, a whole sort of diverse group of people in one church, and, and he is trying to help them embrace the fact that they have a new, transcendent, superseding identity, a calling in Christ to act as one family. And so I want you to see this. Paul builds his whole argument here that we'll look closely at in a minute about how we're to treat one another. He builds it on our new identity, both individually and collectively, that we as people who have now come to faith in Christ, who have received the work of Christ on our behalf, we now possess. We possess a new gospel-oriented identity, Jesus-shaped identity. Consider for a second what it says in Ephesians 2, 1 through 7. We just read from chapter, from chapter 4, 1 through 6. But look on the screen with me what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 7. It says it, it, it has this past identity reality and contrasts it with who we are now and where we're going. He says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You see, this is what we are apart from being reconciled to God. Our life just disintegrates into our own desires, our own impulses, reckless behaviors, sin dominating us. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, just buying into whatever was the flow of the culture, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Notice he's contrasting. This is not godliness. Carrying out just whatever our desires are. Following our impulses. And because of that, we were by nature children of wrath. Deserving of God's judgment, he means. Like the rest of mankind. And then verse 4. Look at the contrast. But God. You see, what happens is, becoming a Christian isn't just a nod to something. It's, a, it's actually an intervention of God in your life where you begin to see the truth that you've been walking in sin and you see the promise of the good news of Jesus held out to you through the cross that you can be forgiven and reconciled to God. But God, how did this happen? Being rich in mercy, because God is so merciful, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ by grace, that means unmerited kindness from God. By grace, you have been saved. Not because of who you were. Not because of your previous identity. Not because of your performance. Not because you finally got wiser. But because God intervened in his kindness to point you to Christ. And now, six, you've been raised up with him. You've been given a status, an identity seated he seated us with him seating has to do with identity it has to do with saying you belong here this is your seat in the heavenly places with christ place of honor so that now he's saying this to all of us we are seated with him we're people gathered to him so that listen to the future orientation in the coming ages from now on into eternity and beyond, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What does God intend to do in eternity to that person you find difficult to love? He intends to pour out the riches of his love all over them. 
You see what he's doing here? He's saying, God has positioned every person who has repented and come to him by faith as an object of his present and future love that will be richly poured out age to age without end. So how are we to relate to someone that God plans to treat like that? Well, that's why Paul says we have a calling. We are a people who will receive that, who have received that kind of mercy, who are promised that kind of grace. Not just me as an individual, but together we are that people. So see this change in identity. It's important for us individually, but it's not just an individual change, which each one of us will be an ongoing recipient of and experience God's grace and kindness toward. It's a collective calling that we exhibit as a spiritual family of people embodying this together. He doesn't stop there. He goes on, if you look in verse 13, it'll be also on the screen for you. He says then this, this has an implication on the way that we are to relate to one another as people who believe this good news. If what we read in 2, 1 through 7 is true about you, then he says what we see in verses 13 through 22 needs to become true about you. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, that means far off from caring about one another, separated. You've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He becomes the basis for which we find peace amidst all of our differences. Who has made us both one. He's taken two things and he said, no, now you belong together. He's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He has paid for all of our sins and reconciled us to him by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinance so that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two making peace. Why did he do that? Verse 16. So that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. Thereby killing the hostility that would exist between us. You see, one of Jesus' purpose in the cross was to kill the basis for which you could be hostile to other people. I mean, that's powerful. And he came and he proclaimed it. He preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, what's the conclusion? Verse 19, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone on which we line up our lives. And what is his purpose for that? Verse 21, listen to that future orientation. In whom the whole structure being joined together now grows. We grow in a particular direction. We grow together into a holy temple in the Lord. And in the Lord, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That prompts an important question. Where does God's Spirit dwell in a special particular way according to this passage? In the midst of our relationships when we embrace the gospel in this peace. How is it made tangible and visible and real. Well, the presence of God, the temple of all real Christians, is the gathered family of his people who express this calling together and make it visible. That's why it doesn't matter if we meet in a school auditorium on a Sunday or in somebody's living room or under a tree, if we embrace the calling that the gospel calls us to, God takes up residence in that place and makes his presence known, experienceable, felt through the substantive relationships we share with one another. We are the temple of God. 
Notice we're not just the temple of God as individuals and dwelt by God, but in a special way we're intended to be the temple of God together. Paul is saying this calling, this purpose and vision of God for us and what his salvation is preparing for us, it begins now as we learn to live it out together rather than live in patterns of sin and brokenness that are primarily relational. The kind of patterns we're often surrounded by and have been trained by in our sinful nature. But while we wait for the full experience of God's salvation, we are growing into this now. And therefore, we are to bear with one another as we grow. That's Paul's instruction. You see, we're not good at this. The assumption is that you and I are still learning not to be hostile to one another because of our own weakness and immaturity. We're not good at it, and so what do we do? As we walk towards this maturity, we bear with one another in love because God, by His Spirit, is bringing us on in this direction to fulfill this calling, and God always accomplishes His will. So, the heart of this passage is an instruction for us to bear with one another in love as we grow toward this kind of maturity. So for the remainder of our time, I want to think about just a a few things then that this passage shows us. Uh, First, the meaning of bearing with one another in love. Then the character of bearing with one another in love. And lastly, we'll just look at the objective basis of bearing with one another in love. The first one we see is the meaning of bearing with one another in love. So if, if, if the way we fulfill this calling, Paul is urging us to, is to bear with one another in love, then What does that really mean? Let's think about it for a second. If you look in the text, Paul begins in verse 1 by urging us to walk in a manner worthy of this calling, which we just talked about. But he hasn't told us yet what that manner is. Beginning in verse 2, he tells us what sort of character qualities it's going to require to have with it. But he says you're going to need this with this main thing. And he gives us two phrases there, with. But still, these character qualities are with the main focus. They're not the main focus of what he says. It isn't until the end of verse 2 that he eventually narrows in on the manner worthy of the calling. And the answer is bearing with one another in love. What is the manner I'm to carry into the relationships that I have with other people? What is the manner particularly that I am to carry into the relationships that I have with other Christians? It's the manner of bearing with one another in love. So, he he says that clearly at the end of verse 2, and then he gives another description immediately, beginning in verse 3, if you look. He says this description, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, I don't want to wear you out with grammar, but that, that second, the eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit is called an appositional phrase. What an appositional phrase is, is it's a way to repeat something you just said right beside it so that it deepens and explains it. And so when he, when he says, bear with one another in love, he's saying something like, bear with one another in love, And that means being eager to maintain the unity of God's spirit in the bond of peace that we have in the gospel. That this is kind of filling out, like what would it look like for me to do that? Well, an eagerness. And that, uh, the idea of eager here specifically is the, the word translated eager in, in your New Testament, probably uh, a good way to think about that would be, um, like strictly it means make every effort to maintain this. Like that's the literal, like most literal kind of wooden way to say that. We're to make every effort to maintain a sense of connection, unified connection with one another because of the gospel. And this is what it means to bear with one another in love. I'm making every effort to do this. Now we said at the beginning of this series, one another, that there was a word, alelon in Greek, that, that sort of uh, is always translated one another in the New Testament, and it means each person does this for the other. We don't think about our others doing it for me. We bring it to the table. That's how a culture is, is established. That's how relationships become stable. I determine I am going to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I am going to make every effort effort to make sure that I give each other person the quality of bearing with them in love. And when I do that for you, and you do that for me, and we do that for one another, 
then what happens is we create an environment in which we can all faithfully and in an ongoing, consistent way pursue this calling. So, now what Paul is doing here is he's making sure the Ephesians, who have all sorts of reasons to be separated, understand this. He is calling them to learn to deeply love one another by bearing with one another's immaturity, weaknesses, and differences. If we're honest in this room, and particularly those of us who who make up this church, we all know that we have a whole set of immaturities, weaknesses, preferences that you may just find weird, you know? I mean, you, you guys can acknowledge that, right? Like, you get to know some of the people in here. Like, Annie reminded me of the book, Everybody's Normal Until You Get to Know Them. <laughs> like, the thing I've learned to really appreciate about the church is how odd I find all the people that I get to know. <laughs> and yet, it's so interesting. Like, when, you're, when your vision is that, like, God has given you this person to love and to appreciate something you hadn't previously pre- appreciated. Like, then it really changes that. It's kind of, it's actually more like, this is way more interesting than just meeting a bunch of people who are my clones. It's easier to meet people who think like you all the time, who act like you all the time, who care about the same things as you, or enjoy the same hobbies. That's easy. But it's, it's life enriching to connect with people who are vastly different than you and learn to appreciate them. Not just like because you have to, but because they're actually a part of God's reflecting image as his image bears, and he made them that way. So we bear with one, the, one another in those preferences, but also, you know, if we're going to grow, we just have to bear with one another in our immaturities. Like there, there are so many ways that each of us need to grow to, to really exhibit Christ-like maturity. If we're honest, we look at our lives and say, here are the things in my life that I'm just not good at, that Jesus was really good at. And so if somebody's going to be in a relationship with me, they're going to have to learn to bear with that. Not because I want to keep doing it, but because the things that need to change most about me are the things that are hardest for me to see and hardest for me to change. And that's true about you as well. And so, you know, very few people are going to acknowledge that and grow in an environment where they feel threatened to be abandoned every time somebody discovers that about them. So literally, the word here for bear with one another means actually to stand up straight. Like, stand up straight. So meaning when someone goes to lean on you, or a burden from someone else is added to your life, you don't just fold like a house of cards. This is what it means to bear with one another in love. Like, somebody could come and They could depend on you for a little while to be the stable and mature one. Now, there's something unhealthy when they do that to you all the time. (laughs) You might have to instruct them in love as well, to admonish them in love to do that. But, but, you know, people in your life, if if you're going to grow good relationships and help other people grow, they need to be able to count on you. When they lean on you and they put some weight because they're feeling weak or or something is going wrong in their life, they need to be able to count that you're going to stand up straight. You're in this place where you can bear with them. And not just because you have to or somebody else is watching, but because from from a place of really wanting to serve them, you genuinely love them. If you want a vision of what you are to grow into as Christians, it's someone who doesn't fold when they have to carry the team for a while because others are not well or ready. Like that is what it looks like to mature. It also means that you don't do it with a bitter spirit that derides them or cuts them down. You do it as an act of love because you genuinely care. So bearing with one another in love honors the communal nature of our spiritual lives together as a people that share a holy calling. Now, many of you have heard me tell the story of the time my dad and I were fly fishing in Montana and found ourselves after dark on the wrong side of a river. And uh, without really knowing where we could get across without drowning. I'm sorry if you missed the details of that story, but just, you know, catch up with us for a second. Quick reminder, my dad was only about five months removed from hip surgery at the time and in his early 70s. Um, The reason I bring it up is because there would not have been anything impressive about me just getting myself across and home safely. The challenge was for both of us to get home together. 
And that meant at certain points standing in the middle of the river and letting him at his less stable moments lean on me. Weirdly, it also meant that even though I was right that he should have been on the upper side of me as the stream was flowing down, he insisted that he go on the lower side, which was strategically terrible. Uh, And he did, and patiently we went over because it was the only way he would do it, and he nearly yanked me underwater. (laughs) But, you know, if the story was, I left my dad there to figure it out, I mean, how impressive would that be? That'd be sort of an embarrassment, wouldn't it? Because the goal is to get, to get across the river together. To get home with one another. For those who missed the story before, we made it. We're fine. We survived and it's now my favorite fishing story of all times. The easy part was me getting across, but our calling was to get home together. For the same reason, there is nothing terribly impressive about you thinking you are living a healthy spiritual life because you've removed yourself relationally from anyone who might need to depend on you and are going to make it home yourself to glory. Like isolated individualist spirituality, that would be easy. And there's nothing impressive about you doing that because God has assigned us to help one another get home faithfully. And that is what we do in a local church. We're called to do it because we love one another and we have committed to one another to carry on this together and get everybody there. And so, so we're called to do this together. This is what it means to bear with one another in love. Okay, so one of the things that Paul does here then is he tells us the sort of qualities we're going to need if we're going to actually do this. If we're, gonna, if we're going to fulfill what this really means, we're going to need some particular qualities cultivated in our lives. And so the second thing is we see the character of bearing with one another in love. Now, if we are going to walk in a manner worthy of this calling, you're going to have to cultivate and highly value some character traits in your life that Paul highlights here that are really a reflection of the core character of Christ. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of verse 2, before he shows us the main idea of bearing with one another love, he said we were going to have have to have some things with it. Like, you could call this like a side order. This is the fries in the order. If we're ordering up maturity, it looks like bearing with one another in love, but it comes with a side order of humility and gentleness and patience. And so let's look at that. He describes these qualities, this character, using the term with in verse 2. He uses the word with two times. The first time he says we're going to need it to be with humility and gentleness. Humility and gentleness. Listen to me, over and over, genuine maturity is described in the New Testament with this picture that a truly mature person has the capability to interact with those who are less mature in a way that is humble and gentle. In fact, if you look at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 2, when it says, here's how leaders in the life of a local church are to act towards those who are struggling, he uses the same ideas. Like, mature leaders are humble and gentle even with those who are failing, with struggling. Jesus describes his own demeanor this way toward us who are still learning to walk with him. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you. Come walk alongside me and learn from me. What does he want us to learn? What will, what will we look like if we become mature with Jesus? For I am gentle and lowly in heart. What does Jesus want to teach us in maturity so that we can do what we need to do with one another to fulfill our calling? He wants to teach us his gentle and lowly heart. And if you come walk with him, he says, you'll find rest for your souls. So, I mean, think about this. If you're mature, what happens when other people come walk alongside you for a while is they feel at rest. They're able to just go, I can be me. I can actually... Let you know what's really going on. 
even if it's pretty bad. And I feel like you, you have a stability that's going to care about me, that you have a humility where you're not going to be condemning me. See, a gentle and lowly heart allows us to come alongside people. And what people experience, if this is you, in your presence they experience rest. Jesus says, if you come and walk alongside me, even for all of your weaknesses, as you learn to walk with me, you're going to feel at rest because of my gentleness and my humility. You know, that's what spiritual maturity feels like. Jesus is this way because this is the way mature people are toward those who are weak and struggling. Insecure and immature people who don't understand the mission of the church are arrogant and harsh with those who are still growing. Because they have no clear understanding of how spiritual growth really works. And the weakness of others exposes their own weaknesses. You see, what they see when they see someone else struggling and weak is they just simply see themselves and they feel thrown off. It's like someone who doesn't have a good foothold when somebody grabs onto them. In their immaturity, they're thrown off. And so we see this gentleness and humility the other character quality that will have to be cultivated in us if we're going to walk in a manner worthy of our calling and bear with one another in love is patience. Let me just be plain. Spiritual growth takes time. Yes, the power of the Spirit in people when they come to faith does cause surprising changes. I've seen it myself, but deep, ongoing, permanent change comes with time as we reevaluate everything in our life in light of who Jesus is and what really matters. And so it takes patience for us to walk alongside one another as we're letting each other grow in maturity. Let's make it plain. If you are impatient, you are still quite immature. If you think people will grow mainly by you harshly criticizing them or using a stronger fist when you slam down your point, you're still immature. If you use your progress to tell others how easy it is to walk with God, you've probably not made it as far as you think you have. You see, the mature know that walking with God requires an unpleasant death to ourselves where God has demonstrated incredible gentleness and patience with us in the process. Where God has stooped down low to concern himself with those who are well beneath him in their place in the universe. And when you have seen that God is gracious and patient with you in that way, you become very ready to imitate these qualities with others. In what area, and I just, I think it would, you should ask a question. In what area has God had to show the most patience with you as you mature? Like even right now, where is God having to exhibit the greatest amount of patience with you? How easy has it been for you to grow in this area where God is showing patience? You see, when you become in touch with that, you begin to relate to the other people in your life through that same kind of care. Now listen, we've talked about the meaning of bearing with one another in love. We've talked about what, what sort of character we'll have to learn to embody or exemplify it. But I think one of the things that people often mistake for what we're talking about is, is to sort of say, well, I guess we don't have to hold one another accountable to anything. and We just go along with everything that others are doing to keep the peace. That's what we mean then, to bear with one another in love. But, that, but I want you to notice... And I want to point out that this is not the vision of this passage. This passage assumes and promotes that there is an objective basis, a standard outside of ourselves that we submit to, and we're called to hold one another to as we bear with one another in walking towards that maturity. So let's just think for a moment as we close about the objective basis for bearing with one another in love. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is that we do not solve this problem of bearing with one another in love by ceasing to challenge one another's behaviors and thoughts and immaturities. It's solved more by how we help one another carry them. We do it gently, we do it patiently, but we do it clearly. We challenge one another in the body of Christ. We bear some of the weight together some of the weight of the consequences of one another's weaknesses along the way to move towards maturity. But listen, we do challenge one another. 
We challenge one another to live up to this sort of life that we have been called into. And the life that we've been called is into isn't defined by what we want to do as individuals, by wanting our own perspective as individuals, but what God has done for us and what God has given to us. Meaning it's defined objectively, clearly. Same idea, same calling, same place for all of us. This is shown by the use of the term one in verses four through six. You notice over and over he says we have one of this, one of that. It's, and he repeats the phrase one so many times here. So in the text, the word one reminds us of something that is really contrary to the flow of our own culture. We've come to overemphasize all the different perspectives that every individual has as those, each person is an, their own authority unto themselves and to underemphasize the authority of God who alone has created the world and can order us back into it as he reconciles us from our sin. We've come to overemphasize all the different perspectives of other people that we've lost a sense of reality. Let's just follow the text. How many bodies of Christ are there? Ultimately, before God, there is just one body made up of all those who have genuinely trusted in Christ by faith. How many spirits are there that rightly empower the people of the church? There is but one Holy Spirit that has been given to us all and acts in unity with itself when we are yielded to it. So the Spirit can bring unity to those who yield to Him. How many ultimate future hopes are there? We have one hope, and for those who share in Christ are moving toward one future provided by God as a gift of grace at the resurrection of the dead. How many lords are there who have genuine authority over us and can command us to submit to him? There are not many, and we are not our own Lord, and there are not many with a bunch of different priorities. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ, who calls for our submission to him and his, and his unified plan and vision for the world. How many faiths are there? There is one genuine faith, he says. It's the faith to acknowledge that we are sinners and trust Jesus' promise to save those who have believed that his death, burial, and resurrection are sufficient to reconcile us to God. How many baptisms are there? There is one objective purpose and act of baptism that declares together that we have been saved and washed for a new way of living publicly together in Christ. How many gods are there who are the genuine father over all creation? There are not many based on who and how we want to believe. There is one father to whom we belong, and he is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has graciously extended his love to sinners by sending his son for us and for our salvation. To say anything else but this, and permit one another to live as though this is not true, is to engage in a foolishness that says that somehow what we think about something is more important than what God has revealed about it in his word. We are called to be a people unified to one another by our submissiveness to God and his truth. And many times, the reason people are so disunified is because they failed to submit themselves to these core truths and to God himself. And it comes out in the way that they treat God's people and others around them. Instead, we are to devote ourselves joyfully and submissively to our one calling and our one hope given by our one Lord who paid the price to gift it to us and live out the one newness of life declared in our baptism, filled with the one Holy Spirit that unites, exercising the one faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and bear with one another in love, making every effort to help one another along until we are all mature before Christ, safely across the river. Would you pray with me? And as we prepare to reflect on these words and celebrate the Lord's Supper, I want you to take a moment to just reflect on what you've heard. How do you need to respond? What is God saying to you through these words? How do you need to specifically think about obeying 
the instruction to bear with one another in love. Maybe you've never submitted your life to Christ. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know, I, I've, I've never really thought about the fact that there's one God who offers His one salvation through His one Son, Jesus. But today I need to turn and receive that and make Him Lord of my life. Right there where you're at, you could just take a moment and respond to God about that. Others, you maybe look around in your relationships and you've given up on people. Whenever they bother you, you've distanced yourself from anyone who doesn't think like you. You find yourself frustrated and impatient. Maybe the Lord would just have you to just confess that. to Draw near to Him, ask for forgiveness. And in a fresh way to submit yourself to Him. Lord, thank You for this time that we've had and we ask that as we come to Your table, Lord, that You would remind us of the unity that You desire for us to exhibit in our relationships that we would learn to bear with one another in love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.